So far in the course, we've talked about how higher cognitive tasks can be performed, but mostly in the context of a fair amount of learning having already taken place. But a major issue is how can the brain bootstrap itself from sensory experience, when the only guidance it can get is a certain amount of genetic information, plus the kind of information that a human parent or teacher can provide. But remembering that information from teachers doesn't go directly to neurons, it's just part of the overall sensory experience of the brain. The teacher responds verbally, by gesture or expression, and in the brain of the learner there are receptive fields detected within the sensory perceptions of these cues, and these receptive field detections must recommend changes to synaptic weights that will improve future behaviours. Recall that there are three major ways in which the brain can record information from experience in order to use that information to guide behaviour. Receptive fields can be recorded in the cortex. Behavioural recommendation weights associated with cortical receptive field detections can be recorded in the basal ganglia. And frequently used sequences of behaviours can be recorded in the cerebellum after the sequence has been learned. And the cerebellum defines very complex receptive fields that can be used as commands to carry out the next behaviour in the sequence, once that behavioural sequence has been initiated. And in each case, ultimately, the information has to be recorded on a spiny neuron, a pyramidal neuron in the cortex, a medium spiny neuron in the striatum, or a Purkinje cell in the cerebellar cortex. So the learning process has to converge on a state in which huge numbers of synapses have all acquired appropriate synaptic weights. Now, in principle, the brain could start off with each cortical receptive field having a random mix of inputs from different senses, and receptive fields could be evolved, just as we described earlier, always detect at least a minimum number, if necessary, expand undetected receptive fields until they're close to detection, and also make use of past contradictory consequence feedback to guide extra receptive field expansion. Then, all possible behaviours could be genetically specified at the atomic level. In other words, brain components corresponding with every possible muscle movement, every possible receptive field indirect activation, and a range of reward behaviours to change recommendation weights. And every receptive field could be given a recommendation weight into every behaviour. And from that starting point, the brain will be exposed to sensory experiences. But given that starting point, it's not at all clear that such a brain would ever converge from here to a useful combination of behaviours, perhaps especially because of the randomness in which the way rewards would be guided, at least initially. So genetic information has to provide rather stronger guidance to the starting point for learning. For example, it specifies a limited number of cortical areas as the starting points for receptive field definitions. Sensory inputs arrive at an even more limited number of areas. And any one area gets most of its inputs from a limited number of other areas. In other words, genetic information specifies a limited number of levels of complexities at which receptive fields will be defined, and natural selection ensures that these levels of complexity are effective for discriminating between circumstances in which different behaviours needed for survival are appropriate. Genetic information can also specify the rough number of inputs that a neuron gets initially, and the kind of combinations of active inputs needed for receptive field detections, in other words, the thresholds. Then, genetic information can determine which cortical areas will provide most of the inputs recommending each behaviour, in other words, which receptive field complexities are most effective for recommending the behaviour type. In summary, although in principle random initial connectivity to define receptive field and recommendation strengths might eventually lead to a viable combination of behaviours, the brain will be unlikely to survive to that point, and in any case would require excessive resources. So in practice, a somewhat more favourable starting point must be defined by genetic information, and somehow 
effective use of guidance from other experienced brains must be possible. So in the next section, we'll discuss how this bootstrapping with assistance uh, from genetic information can occur for a, a particular example of learning.